We are so glad that you are worshiping with Ecclesia this morning. What a great day to be in worship together. We are excited here in Asheville, North Carolina to have gotten a peak of the sun today and uh, a little bit yesterday. And we're gonna enjoy that uh, weather, no matter what it is where you are as we worship together. If you were with us in person and we were in our regular worship space, uh, our children would be gathering at the back right now, deciding who was going to light the candle and who was going to carry the cross and who would carry the stall. And they would, we'd all come up together and they would place the stall. This is my brand new Linton stall that they would be excited to place around my neck and make sure that that my locket didn't get covered up and that everything lined up just right. And then we turn and if you have your Lenten candle that you got in your Lent kit, I hope that you will light that now with me as our children would do if they were here. They might do it just like I'm doing it, trying to find the, the switch here. And we light those candles together. And the children and I would then turn to you Hold out our hands and say, may the peace of God be with you and also with you. Let us worship God together. I'm 
Our scripture reading today, our psalm reading, will be done by Dawn Mitchell. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, I, I did what Jay said. I unmuted and I show you my video, that's all. Today's psalm is a special psalm. Um, it is the psalm that Jesus um, used, uh, or the psalm that Jesus invoked on the cross. Um, it's Psalm 22. Um, we are going to read the whole thing. And uh, I have it pulled up on my screen. Very sorry. There we go. Um, uh, we're going to read the whole thing. And as we read, um, consider listening for the parts of the the psalm. Uh, it can make it more a more enriching experience if you do. There are three parts to the psalm. A lament, a change of heart, and a promise, a praise, praise peace. Listen to how David, guilty from his sin with Bathsheba, comes back to faith after crying out to God. In fact, see if you can figure out where it switches. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you left me all alone? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my anguished groans? My God, I, I cry out during the day, but you don't answer. Even at night time, I don't stop. You are the Holy One enthroned. You are Israel's praise. Our ancestors trusted you. They trusted you and you welcomed them. You rescued them. They cried out to you and they were saved. They trusted you and they weren't ashamed, but I'm just a maggot, less than human, insulted by one person, despised by another. All who see me make fun of me. They gape, shaking their heads. He committed himself to the Lord. So let God rescue him. Let God deliver him because God likes him so much. But you're the one who pulled me from the womb placing me safely at my mother's breasts. Mm -hmm. I was thrown on you from birth. You've been my God since I was in my mother's womb. Please don't be far from me because trouble is near and there's no one to help. Many bulls surround me, mighty bulls of the Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths at me like a lion ripping and warring. I'm, I'm poured out, I'm poured out like water. All my bones have fallen apart. My heart is like wax. It melts inside me. My strength is dried up like a piece of broken pottery. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You've set me down in the dirt of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of evil people circle me like a lion. Oh, my poor hands and feet. I can count all my bones. Meanwhile, they just stare at me, watching me. They divvy up my garments among themselves. Mm -hmm. They cast lots for my clothes. But you, Lord, don't be far away. You are my strength. Come quick and help me. Deliver me from the sword. Deliver my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. Mm -hmm. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the very center of the congregation. That's right. All of you who revere the Lord, praise him. All of you who are Jacob's descendants, honor him. All of you who are Israel's offspring, stand in awe of him because he didn't despise or detest the suffering of the one who suffered. He did not hide his face from me. No, he listened when I cried out for help. Mm -hmm. I offer praise to the great congregation because of you. Right. I will fulfill my promises in the presence of those who honor God. Let all those who are suffering eat and be full. Let all who seek the Lord praise him. I pray your hearts live forever. Mm. Every part of the earth will remember and come back to the Lord. Every family among the nations will worship you. Because the right to rule belongs to the Lord, he rules all nations. Mm -hmm. Indeed, all the earth's powerful will worship him. All who are descending to the dust will kneel before him. My being also lives for him. 
the Yeshua descendants will serve him. Generations will come to be told about my Lord. They will proclaim God's righteousness to those not yet born, telling them what God has done. This is the word of the Lord. Mm. Thanks be to God. Amen. What a beautiful reminder of God's humanity in all of us. Thank you, Dawn, for that beautiful reading. During Lent, we are reminded of the sacrificial life of Jesus. We remember that our own sin pains the very heart of God. And so as we sing this Lenten prayer, we ask that God make us aware of our sin, that we might confess that sin before God and this church. The recording we have for this is uh, done by Baker Laramore, our son and his wife, Addison. We invite you to sing along with Addison, though we admit that the sound quality is not perfect. They hope to re record it this week with Addison having a better microphone, but um, got pretty, I think everybody was able to follow it last week. And I hope that you will this week as well, as you take this time in prayer to confess your sins. Let us pray. Amen. Church, hear the good news. You're forgiven. You are forgiven. Mm -mm. No, no, it doesn't matter how big it is. 
It doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter how dark the secret. You, beloved, are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As we come now to our time of prayers of the people, I have a confession to make. My youngest daughter loves maps and always has. And she found this game online where, or it's not really a game, it's a quiz um, to learn all the countries in the world. And I thought that would be impossible, but it's not. And I have gotten a little bit addicted to this game, but there's a downside because when you know where these places are in the world, when their coastline comes quickly to mind, when you hear of struggles in those countries, you feel closer to them. And so this morning, as I was looking at headlines, I saw um, that Eritrean soldiers had massacred people in a church in Ecuador. Nope, Ethiopia. I know, I know, I got it. And my heart broke a little bit because I feel like I know them better now. And it just made me think about all the people all over the world who have celebrations and, and travesties and victories and difficulties that we never even think of. And so today I invite you in our prayer time to open your heart to the people of the world, the whole world, as we pray together. Loving God, we have already been to church. We have already felt your love and your power in the words of our song, in the words of your psalm, and in our confessional prayer. We have felt you here and we are grateful. Oh God, we confess that we are guilty of navel gazing. We are guilty of thinking only of ourselves and ours. It's too hard to think about those outside, but Lord, now we throw open the gates of our hearts and ask that you would pour into us the awareness of others in this world, others who like us love you, others who like us fall short, others who like us wonder and doubt and question. Oh God, bring the others in close that we might be as one. Oh Lord, we pray especially for our beloved sister church in Lava Ita, Cuba as they worship this morning. We thank you for the gift of their friendship, for the gift of their people, and we ask that your presence would be felt mightily there. And throughout Cuba, as they struggle to raise their hands, raise their head above the oppression in their world, we ask your special blessing upon them. God, even as we open our hearts and invite others in, we're distracted. We are. We, we are distracted by people whose names come quickly to our minds and, and hold tight there. And so as part of our offering, as part of our worship, oh God, we give you their names, knowing you know their pain. And as we lift up these names to you, we ask, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The people in Orlando, Florida.
Emma Jason and her family. My dog, Bear Bear. Our friend Carolina in Matanzas, whose mother died this week. Our teachers and frontline workers. Jill Laramore. Gina. Those working Boys. to get the vaccine out as quickly and efficiently as possible. Yes. Boyce and Jean Earnhardt, mm -hmm. family of Tommy Lyman style, and our sweet Karen. Mm -hmm. Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. Well, guess what time it is. It's time for our children's time. And I'm so glad that you're with us. Now, everybody who has gotten a lint kit has in their lint kit, some um, items to hold on to. You have um, a, a, a towel and it, that's coming up soon. And last week we talked about the Band-Aid. Next week, we're gonna be looking at this little picture that you have in your kit of the, the bread and the wine. And there's some other things here, but today we're gonna look at the leaf. So if you have your leaf with you, if you would get that out, and I'm going to find the sheet of paper that I was had here to look at. But no, maybe I won't. So we're going to talk about leaves. See, I'm, I'm just looking around here because I had on my desk another leaf. And I think it took off, as leaves are wont to do. When I was a little girl, we played with all kinds of leaves. We used them to make food in our playhouse. We use them to um, make necklaces when we were playing outside. And sometimes when we were being extra silly, we would act like they were fans. This one can't really help much in that regard. But in Jesus's day, they had leaves that we call palms, palm branches. Now today's scripture, kids, is kind of sad. It's not the happiest story in scripture because life's not like that. Sometimes we have bad days. You guys ever have bad days? Boy, I know I do. And so sometimes we have bad days and that's just part of life, but we also have good days. And so in a couple of weeks, three or four weeks, we're going to be talking about the day that Jesus rode a donkey, a little baby donkey into Jerusalem and as he was coming in to town the people just lined up on either side of the street and they had big old leaves palm branches great big leaves and they were waving them so they could get Jesus's attention they were kind of like those big foam fingers you know that you have at, at, at games sometimes they were waving those and some of them said oh oh let's put them down on the ground so so the donkey won't have to walk on the hard hard road and that so Jesus's ride will be softer and they put those branches down 
and, and they waved those palm branches at Jesus. So he had nice, cool breeze as he came through. And it was a great day for Jesus. Now, fortunately, there were bad days that followed that, bad days that came before that, and really great, fantastically, awesomely, wonderful super days that came after this great day. But whenever you see a leaf, I want you to remember that there are always good days coming. Jesus had bad days, just like you do and like I do. But Jesus had good days too. And he celebrates with you when you have a good day, just like he cries with you when you have a bad day. Because you remember, right? Jesus loves you to pieces. And there is nothing you can do about it. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for nature and for the beauty of it, that we can go outside and be reminded just by the leaves on the trees that you love us. And we love you too, Jesus. Amen. Well, now we have our scripture reading, and it is a gospel reading, and at Ecclesia, when we're face-to-face, -face, those who are physically able are invited to stand for the gospel reading. Um, and I, I'd like to remind us all during this time of at-home worship that this is an invitation to stand for the reading of God's word, even if it's not convenient, even if you'd rather stay seated. It's an opportunity to just stand out of love and respect for the words of Jesus. So if you are physically able, we invite you to stand as we read the gospel according to Mark out of chapter 8, beginning in verse 31 through 38. Please stand if you will. Then he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked thing. Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowds with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And for the, those who, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Well, I knew what was coming, and I still just about went Pentecostal. Have y'all been to church this morning? Because I've been to church this morning. What a beautiful voice. And as a reminder, that video is on the playlist for this week on our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure that you do that so that you can see all of those playlists and the different um, artists we feature each week. Whew. Give me Jesus. Amen. Well, if people are watching me when I walk my dogs, they're probably going to suspect that I'm not thinking exclusively about my dogs because of the facial expressions that I might make in response to the podcast that I'm listening to. Because when I walk the dogs, I'm usually listening to one of the podcasts that I listen to in preparation for our Sunday mornings. There's Pulpit Fiction uh, with Rob and Eric. There is Crackers and Grape Juice. And possibly my favorite is Two Bubba's in a Bible on Lectionary Lab Live. So I listen to them and sometimes I say things I don't really agree with or that surprise me. And this week I heard this. There was a caution, I can't remember which one of them said it, about this text today, about where Jesus says, take up your cross. And the caution was this. They said that at times this text of Jesus saying, take up your cross and follow me, has been used to keep people in oppression or in difficult marriages, toxic relationships, um, unhealthy jobs, or uh, whatever. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Because I had never heard anything like that in church, that, that God has called you to take up the cross of toxicity, that God has called you to take up the cross of oppression? Look, I don't know if y'all have ever heard that in church, but just like we get it wrong all the time in our lives, people who preach often get it wrong too. And that is not the message that Christ has for you in today's text. Christ is not calling you into toxicity. Christ may be calling you into poverty, but Christ is not calling you to oppression. Christ may be calling you to deny yourself certain luxuries, but God is not calling you to self-harm. God may be calling you to look outside of yourself to the needs of others, but God is not calling you. I promise you, God is not calling you to ignore the physical signs of your needs, the emotional signs of your needs. God loves you. So, as you listen to today's text and today's message, remember that, that when God calls you to take up your cross, I don't care what the preacher said. He was not calling you, Jesus was not calling you to stay in a situation where you feel less than beloved. Got that? Everybody got that? Any questions? All right. Don't listen to those preachers, they were wrong. Don't handle snakes either, you'll get bit. So if we're all past that, then let's go for a walk. Imagine, if you will, that you're out with a group of your best friends, maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 of you, and you're hiking together. And let's say you've chosen a hike that's not in the woods per se, it's, it's kind of dusty and rocky, kind of out in the open, but there's some vegetation and hills and, and, and a lot of dirt and sand, and, but the trails are nice. The trails are, are well-marked and 
often uh, they're they're well trod so they're easy to travel on and there's a breeze blowing so there must be a a lake nearby you can hear the low conversations of others in the group as they comment on the day's politics or their own observation or even the weather. You hear insects buzzing around and birds twittering in the distance, maybe even some calls of wild animals. But you're walking along with your group of friends and, and you realize you've kind of gotten to the back of the crowd and, and you hear somebody up front, this guy, oh man, he, he's like the natural leader of the group. I mean, he's just always been, you've known him since you were a kid and he's always just been the one who took the role of leading the group. But here lately, you've noticed with this guy that he's, he's even more than the leader. He, he's more than than you ever thought he was. It's like he's a preacher, but he's also, he's also a healer and he's kind hearted and fun, but he's also a bit of a radical. He like, he ignores people that everybody usually pays attention to, the powerful, the people in position. And then he embraces people that are usually ignored. He's, he's kind of weird, but he's wonderful too. And, and so you've drifted far away from him and you work your way up so that you're close enough to hear him. And just as you get with an earshot, you hear him say, so uh, what are folks saying about me? And you don't say a word. First of all, you know that Peter will say something anyway, because Peter always has something to say and he's going to jump in there before anybody else has a chance. So you don't say anything. But it's not Peter who speaks up, it's others. And, and some of them say, well, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and others say the prophets. And you think, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, that's what I've been hearing. Maybe I hope he'll finally put some of these rumors to rest. I've known him his whole life. There's no way he's a Elijah, I don't think. I knew John the Baptist. He, think that's right and then then he thinks about that for a minute and then he says so well who do you guys say that I am and then of course Peter you know Peter is the one this time and he goes you're the Messiah and I think by George Peter you know he always has been smart he's just impulsive and by George he's got it right I think I think he is the Messiah because you know lately food's been coming at it like just thin air it seems like and and then there's a way he touched that blind guy yesterday well I mean the formerly blind guy because now the guy can see it's just like unbelievable and you're thinking about all that when when the voice of the leader breaks in and the tone stops you in your tracks because he says don't tell anybody and you realize oh my gosh this guy really is the Messiah. If you can imagine that, you can imagine how the disciples were feeling just before the text that we read today. Some were probably surprised that they weren't surprised that Jesus was the Messiah. Some surely doubted. Some just wanted to go tell someone, especially since Jesus said not to. Imagine they were looking around at each other and trying to gauge each other's reaction. Fear, worry, relief, excitement. And it's into all of this energy of chapter 8, where in the beginning Jesus has fed the 4,000, and then he has an argument with Pharisees. He's always fighting with those guys. And then um, he argues with the disciples, because he's always arguing with them and Mark. And then he heals the blind guy in Bethsaida. And then, beginning in verse 27, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Now, you know Caesarea Philippi, right? I mean, that's a serious place because Caesarea, that's named after Caesar. Caesar and Philippi, well, that was Herod, Herod Philip. And so this is a seriously governmental place that they're headed. And on their way to that city, 
Jesus has this conversation with them. Who do you say that I am? And right then, look at the very next word in verse 31. Your text may start with and or then or next, but it gives the 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 mean gives you conveys the meaning that this happened right away so they go Jesus says don't tell anyone and then Jesus began to teach them that the son of man must suffer and as best we can tell according to Mark this is the first the disciples have heard of this because it says he began right after that he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer and they must have had a sort of emotional whiplash at that news especially since Jesus didn't use those parables he usually used but he just said it flat out just said it straight there's no metaphor or nothing Jesus just spoke plainly there's no question what he meant here there was no need for inter inter interpretation Everybody knew exactly what he meant. And it's all just too much for poor Peter. And so our text tells him Peter took him aside. Now, just pause right there. And let's all just give a little credit to Peter because it is not in Peter's nature, nature to pause and take someone aside to rebuke them. He used remarkable self-control and impulse control here. And so I think we can all give Peter extra points for taking Jesus aside to rebuke him. And so he takes him aside and I've got a feeling that Peter said just as plainly to Jesus as Jesus has said to the disciples, look, Jesus, this is not a good idea, this suffering gig. And I get it, don't you? I mean, I spent much of my teen church years trying to talk Sunday school teachers and youth volunteers out of the crucifixion. Poor souls. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I kept telling teachers, look, if it's all about the sacrifice, can we just all kill some lambs? I mean, I don't want to kill no lamb, but I'd rather kill a lamb than Jesus. I don't, I don't want this crucifixion. I don't like it. I don't want Jesus to suffer like that. Now, as far as I know, the adult leaders in my life did not say, get behind me, Satan, at least not to my face. However, um, it was in those years that our mother became the Sunday school teacher for the teen girls department. I think that was when my sister and I were both teenagers. And you know, when I realized that she might not have wanted to do that this morning, <laughs> This morning, I thought, huh, I wonder if mother would have stayed in her, rather stayed in her own Sunday school class than teach our Sunday school class. I wonder if maybe she just had to do that to, to get us all out of trouble and help her husband keep his job. Don't know. Um, and, you know, don't need to know. But the point is, I get Peter's reluctance. I do. See, Peter... Peter wasn't seeing the crucifixion from the other side of the resurrection like we do. He wasn't looking at a shiny gold cross hanging from a gold chain. He knew up close and personal what crucifixion looked like. He saw it every day. It was the preferred punishment by the Romans. They, they crucified people right along the street up close so people didn't have to go out of their way. They just see it on their way to work. Jesus didn't want, Peter didn't want Jesus to go through that. Peter did not want Jesus to go through what he'd seen with his own eyes. He wanted to save Jesus from Jesus' own self. But Jesus knows something that Peter doesn't yet understand, and that is that the work that Jesus has been called to do will involve suffering. And he can't be tempted to turn away from that reality because it's too hard. And so he, he stops Peter cold with his response as the common English Bible reads, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. <laughs> the text doesn't say, but I imagine that Peter at first went, what? And then went, yeah, well, that's fair. You're right. I, yep, yeah, you got me there. 
because Peter, like Jesus, was familiar with God's thoughts. I I don't really think Jesus had to say anything else. I, I don't think they argued about it. I think Jesus, I think Peter got it. And I wonder if, if Peter went, oh yeah. I wonder if he started singing, humming the, the tune to Psalm 22. I wonder if Jesus joined in. And as they sang that familiar song together, tears kind of rolled down their cheeks because they thought, oh, I don't want to feel like a maggot. Oh, God, I don't want to be in this situation. I wonder if their voices lifted as they came to the end, knowing that, okay, there is good coming. It's just a little far off right now. I wonder if, as they sang that song, if they remembered Abraham and how God called Abraham to go and Abraham went, but it sure wasn't easy, especially when Abraham was thinking his own thoughts and not God's thoughts. But even when he was thinking God's thoughts, it was hard. I wonder if Peter and and Jesus in that moment remembered Abraham's great grandson, Joseph, and thought about the choices that he made and how his own humanness, how thinking human thoughts took him on a very bad path, but that God redeemed him. And even that redemption involved pain. I wonder if they thought about Moses trying to do what God called him to do, but running into obstacles, getting frustrated with those crazy people out in the wilderness. And as they sung that song, Psalm 22, I wonder if they thought, yeah, but you know, even though they suffered, they came out glorifying God. And maybe that's, that's what this road is about, maybe. I bet, I bet that's it. So I don't know, as, the, as Peter kept singing, Jesus called in the crowds. You guys, come on up. Come on. I want you all to hear this because look, this is no prosperity gospel message here. Don't follow me if you want to get wealthy. Don't follow me if you want things to go easy for you. Don't follow me if you're not willing to deny yourself. Because I'm not about that. Jesus said, y'all come in close. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to face some long, hard days. There's going to be pain involved. It won't be easy. In fact, just plan on giving me your life. And trust me, even though it'll be hard, in the end... It'll be worth it. That's what you're going to have to do, Jesus said. If you're going to follow me, take a step of faith on this really hard road and hear the gospel that the road may be hard, the road may be long, but it doesn't lead to your demise. It leads to your redemption. It leads to eternal life. It leads to glory. So Jesus says, come follow me. And those who followed him said, give me Jesus. You can have the whole world, but give me Jesus. Let us pray. Loving God, take our hearts thrown open wide to your love and let us feel the road beneath our feet, knowing that if this road is long, if this road is hard, If it is with you, it is the road to glory. And we trust you, Lord, whatever that looks like. Because it's in your name that we pray. Amen. 
Well, church, you've heard the word of God. You've heard the word read, prayed, sung, and you've sung it yourself. And so now I invite you to respond in whatever way God is calling you to respond. Don't be afraid. Maybe a hard road, but it's the best road you'll ever walk on. Thank you again, Michael, for your gifts, for sharing those with us each Sunday. We are grateful for those recordings of the hymns. We so appreciate the time that Michael spends on those, even though he works third shift at the hospital in the COVID, COVID unit. So we are grateful for Michael, even as we pray for him and the work that he is doing for our church and for the world. Well, church, I hope you've heard the message this morning because you are loved. 
and there is nothing you can do about it. Go in peace to serve God. I'll see you next week.